This podcast is made possible in part by Patreon support, and I'd like to say thank you to our newest patron, Nev. Thank you so, so much, Nev, for joining the Patreon. Uh, If you would like to be as absolutely wonderful, incredible, and amazing as Nev, then head on over to japankyo.com slash Patreon to sign up for as little as $1 a month. You can sign up for $3 a month and that'll give you access to Japanese Plus Alpha, a podcast that I do about the Japanese language. So whatever you sign up for, I would greatly, greatly appreciate it. Once again, thank you so much, Nev. And with that, let's get to the show. Welcome to Japan Station. I'm your host, Tony Vega. Let's get right into it. So, my guest today is Dr. Tom Gill. Dr. Gill is a professor of social anthropology at the Faculty of International Studies at Meiji Gakuin University in Yokohama. Uh, He's done research on various topics, um, including in more recent years, the Fukushima nuclear disaster. But for many years, Dr. Gill uh, did research on homelessness in Japan and Japanese quote unquote slums. Uh, He is the author of a 2015 book called Yokohama Street Life, The Precarious Career of a Japanese Day Laborer. If you're curious about the book, maybe use the Amazon affiliate link, japankyo.com slash Amazon link in the show notes doesn't cost you anything extra. Uh, But today we are going to be talking about homelessness in Japan and Japanese slums. Um, I won't explain really much more because Dr. Gill is going to do an absolutely wonderful job in explaining probably everything you're maybe curious about. So (laughs) because, well, he explained everything that I was curious about. Um, Now, I didn't get a chance to read uh, Dr. Gill's book, Yokohama Street Life, but I did read some excerpts. And those excerpts were just yeah, they, they, they caught my attention immediately. I thought the book was written in a, a way that was not just informative, but really sucked me in and made me want to find out more about Dr. Gill's research. So from there, I found some other articles that he wrote and uh, I was just thoroughly intrigued. I wanted to find out more. So I reached out to Dr. Gill and thankfully he agreed to be on the show. So here we go. Here is my conversation with Dr. Tom Gill. The next stop is Japan Station. I think maybe a a good point to start is maybe you can give us an idea of like what kind of areas you do your research, like where these places are, because I mean, I, I think the average person that just visits Japan for a short amount of time probably has not been to a lot of these areas. Okay, Tony. Mm-hmm. So uh, I first came to Japan in 1983. And uh, mm. after a couple of years working as a school teacher in rural mm. Yamanashi, I mm. got a job working for Kyodo News uh, in Tokyo in 1985. Mm. And while I was there, uh, I came across a very surprising news story. Uh, it was about a brutal murder of uh, the a union leader of uh, a union of day laborers and he mm-hmm. had been murdered by a yakuza gangster um mm. and it was very surprising to me because until then i pretty much bought into the idea that Jap- japan was a uh, what they call a so churyu shakai a general middle class society there weren't mm-hmm. any particular particularly uh, super rich or super poor people. Everybody was getting along pretty well and harmoniously. So mm-hmm. when I saw this story, uh, it was um, quite a, a shock. And I decided I wanted to uh, check it out for myself. And so mm-hmm. I went to Sanya, uh, which was um, where this uh, day labor union was based. And uh, mm-hmm. Sanya is a district in the northeast 
of central Tokyo. Uh, the nearest station for anyone who wants to go there is Minami Senju on the Hibiya mm -hmm. line or uh, JR uh, Joban line. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, Sanya is what they call in Japan a doya guy, uh, which mm -hmm. means, uh, well, it translates as something like a flop house town or mm -hmm. uh, to Americans, perhaps a skid row. Uh, mm -hmm. that's to say it's, uh, it's a slum district, but it's mm -hmm. a, a rather special kind of slum district. Uh, uh, the people there are nearly all men. Uh, mm -hmm. slums in most countries around the world have women and children as well. Mm -hmm. Um, the, uh, Doya guy, uh, is, um, a slum district populated by single men. They're either mm. divorced or separated from their wives or they never got married. Uh, mm. and they, w they, uh, traditionally work as day laborers, uh, meaning mm. that they get out of bed incredibly early in the morning, like about 4 a.m., uh, mm. and stand on the street corner waiting for somebody to come and offer them a job, uh, mm. typically on a building site or in the docks. Uh, those are mm -hmm. the two main employers. Uh, anyway, so I went to Sanya, uh, in, I think it was January of 1986 and was amazed to find that there were street riots going on there at about mm. four or five in the morning when the rest wow. of Tokyo was still sound asleep, uh, because uh -huh. the day laborers uh, were very angry about this murder and they were supported by radical students wearing helmets, um, uh, masks to conceal their faces from the police and, mm -hmm. um, with armed with baseball bats, throwing stones, petrol bombs, Molotov cocktails, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And they were basically engaged in a kind of pitched battle with about, uh, well, several hundred um, heavily armoured riot police. Mm -hmm. And this w happened every day for several weeks after this murder. Uh, so uh, that was my first encounter with Doya Guy. And oh. um, uh, to cut a very long story short, I wrote mm -hmm. um, a 600-word article about it one day later, and a 700-page doctoral thesis about it 10 years mm -hmm. later. Wow. <laughs> and I've been interested in Doya Guy ever since. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the word comes from a kind of uh, very old sort of Japanese uh, street slang. Uh, in Japanese, as you may know, the word mm -hmm. yado means right. um, an inn, uh, a, a place to stay, and uh, you turn it round and you get doya. Uh, there are many mm -hmm. cases in Japanese uh, slang where words are turned round like that, and gai yeah. means a, a town, so hence a, 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 a town of uh, cheap dwellings. And uh, there are three very famous doya gai in Japan, uh, mm -hmm. Sanya in Tokyo, uh, Kamagasaki in Osaka and Kotobuki Cho in Yokohama. And as mm. I developed my research, I ended up concentrating mainly on Kotobuki Cho. That, that's my home doya guy, if you like. I, I live fairly near Yokohama. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just, this is something that just struck me. I, I, I'm reminded of um, the anime manga Ashita no Joe because yes. that happens in like the post-war area, like kind of decades. And then they're in this very rundown area. And I, I can't help but suspect that Doya Guy might have, the word might have come out from around that t point in time. And well, we well we're, Tony, the mm -hmm. <laughs> Tony, Ashita no Joe, yes. a fantastic um, manga by the great uh, Chiba Tetsuya, mm -hmm. uh, is actually set in Sanya. There you so, go. Okay. <laughs> so, in, in fact, Ashton or Joe is the most famous person ever to come out of Sanya, um, uh -huh. which is kind of sad because he's a fictional sure. character, <laughs> not yeah, not yeah, a real yeah. person. 
Yeah, but yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. if you go to Sanya today, you can see life-size um, cardboard cutouts of uh, Joe and the other characters in that manga uh, mm. in the Iroha shopping mall in Sanya. Interesting. Yeah. Huh, huh, huh. Yeah. No, because I I did see some of the anime, and it's it's very striking to see that that Japan that you know while like you don't quite see that like to that extreme you know like we're still dealing with the kind of uh, how can I put it the current Sanya is still of course a direct effect of the Sanya that is depicted in that show right? Yes, indeed. Uh, mm. Although um, Sanya and the other Doya guy have greatly mm. changed in mm-hmm. the um what is it uh 37 years mm-hmm. that i've been studying them uh, mm-hmm. and uh the biggest change is that the aging of the population which mm-hmm. as you know is a major problem for mm-hmm. japan as a whole has been mm-hmm. happening much more quickly in doya guy uh, mm-hmm. in the old days there used to be a lot of strong young men in in doya guy um mm-hmm. and uh and uh, s- some of them had a, a strong sense of working class pride uh mm-hmm. the the doya guy were notorious for riots um mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the one that i saw in in sanya was uh, in a long tradition uh, and mm-hmm. um in fact back in the 1960s there were some left wing Japanese uh, um, scholars and activists who thought that if there was ever going to be a communist revolution in Japan, it might start Mm -hmm. in the Doya guy. Uh, Nowadays, nobody uh, thinks that anymore because Mm -hmm. the men in the Doya guy have just become far too old and weak Mm -hmm. uh, to start a revolution. In fact, they get that, you know, uh, it's as much as they can do to keep body and soul together. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, so most of them are now too old and weak to mm-hmm. um, to do uh, hard manual labor. And mm-hmm. uh, gradually, as the Japanese authorities have uh, loosened up the, their uh, way of running welfare in Japan, more and mm-hmm. more of them have uh, uh, ended up on welfare. You may know Mm. that in Japan that we have this basic welfare safety net called Seikatsu Mm -hmm. Hogo or Livelihood Protection. And Mm. nowadays, probably 80 or 90 percent of the men who live in Doyagai are in fact Mm. on welfare. Mm. Now, by live in Doyagai, does that mean that, you know, well, I I assume that there's a range within this this the, what I'm about to ask, but um, like there's some people that actually have some places where they actually live, like a some sort of small apartment, where there's also other people that actually are homeless and live outside in in a park or river bank or in those kinds of places. Uh, okay, well, um, mm-hmm. uh, doya guy have doya, uh, mm-hmm. uh, which, which are um, you know. They're very cheap hotels or -hmm. very expensive apartment buildings, depending on which way you look at it. Mm. So a typical Doya room uh, is about uh, two or three tatami mats in Mm -hmm. area. Um, One tatami mat is uh, about Uh, 1.7 square meters. So we're talking about um, four or five square meters of living space. And uh, the the older doya uh, do have tatami mats. They have um, uh, very little else uh, uh, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it, uh, a, a lank futon and a, a pillow, and that's about it. Nowadays mm-hmm. um, we have so-called deluxe doya, um, mm-hmm. which uh, have things like air conditioning. TV, mm-hmm. uh, refrigerator, um, mm. uh, but one thing that hasn't changed is the size. Uh, even mm-hmm. even these so-called uh, deluxe doya, which have mostly been um, done up 
or in some cases newly built uh, with welfare cases in mind because city governments won't uh, allow welfare people to stay in places that uh, don't have a certain basic minimum standard mm-hmm. of accommodation. Mm-hmm. Right. <clears throat> anyway, um, the, the dirty old doyer, the nice new doyer, they, they're still the same size, they're still tiny, and mm-hmm. they still have no toilet, no shower, uh, not a drop of water in the room. Uh, you have mm-hmm. to share um, washing facilities with perhaps um, uh, 10 or a dozen other uh, people living on the same floor. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A few of them have uh, showers in the basement uh, or even uh, a communal bath, but a lot of them don't have that. And so an extra expense of living in a doya is having to use coin showers uh, mm-hmm. where you put 100 yen or 200 yen in a slot and then you can have a warm shower for, uh, I think, typically five minutes per 100 yen. Right. And... Uh, the cost of staying in these places, uh, well, the cheapest ones nowadays are probably around a thousand yen a night or a little more, perhaps 1200 mm-hmm. yen. And mm-hmm. the nice ones are maybe 2500 yen or even 3000 yen. Wow. Now, that's, um, that's very cheap compared with, uh, pretty much any other hotel in Japan. Sure. But uh, you have to remember that uh, a lot of the men are not are, are not using them like a hotel. They're actually mm-hmm. living there long term. And if you mm-hmm. multiply that that uh, cheap nightly rent by thirty days, you end up with a monthly rent that is um, at least thirty thousand yen and can be as much as seventy or eighty thousand yen, right. which in most Japanese cities would uh, buy you quite a nice, you know, uh, uh, well, rent you a fairly nice two-room apartment with your own small kitchen and bathroom. Uh, So uh, that's why I say they're either very cheap or very expensive, depending on which way you look at it. Mm -hmm. And I I guess, you know, the, the, the bar for getting an apartment is higher and you need to of course have the key money and they yeah. want you to have a job etc cetera, etc cetera. so that kind of forces them to stay in that kind of in that area in the those doya guy is that kind of how it works exactly mm-hmm. um al- although um as uh long-term residents uh, mm-hmm. uh residences sorry they are um uh, actually surprisingly expensive uh, they do mm-hmm. have the advantages that you don't need any key money, you don't mm-hmm. need to pay a deposit, uh, you don't mm-hmm. need a, a guarantor, uh, and um, you don't even have to um, prove that you're giving them your real name. Uh, so mm-hmm. if you're looking for somewhere that is um, simple and anonymous, then mm-hmm. uh, they're very handy. Uh, and so if you go to a doy guy, you'll find police posters about wanted criminals here and there because mm-hmm. holding up in a doya guy is right. a traditional way to, to avoid the law if you've huh. if you've committed a crime well that that reminded me of something that i, I was reading in one of your articles um in, in failed manhood like you mentioned that you know people have different reasons for um being in the situation that they are, whether it's a doya guy or just completely homeless. And one of the examples you give is somebody that was refusing to accept the um, welfare because they were trying to uh, lay low until kind of the, the what, what do you call it, yeah. like the kind of the statute of limitations yeah. or whatever, the, the, the deadline goes out on their loans. They had a bunch of like yes. debt that they had to repay. And so they were trying to kind of lay low, I guess. Uh, yes. Um, there are quite a few guys like that um, mm-hmm. who have got in trouble with Sarakin, uh, loan sharks. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, if the loan shark has not um, sent you a demand for five years, uh, mm-hmm. I believe the loan uh, lapses. 
Uh, and um, so that is, is one reason for um, going to ground in a doya guy or possibly mm -hmm. um, living homeless for a spell. Um, mm -hmm. Other uh, men who uh, end up homeless are sometimes uh, waiting until they reach the age of 65, at which mm -hmm. point uh, applications for welfare are more or less automatically approved. Mm. If you're younger mm -hmm. than that uh, and you haven't got an obvious um, disability or uh, uh, injury, some reason mm -hmm. why you can't work, then you may be turned down for welfare. Although mm -hmm. that doesn't happen as, as often as it used to be. I think the authorities have softened on welfare. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, the number of homeless people in Japan is actually very low compared with other developed uh, nations. But mm -hmm. uh, the number of people on welfare has been rising steadily for um, some quarter of a century. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, it... It troughed at around 800,000 people in the mid 1990s, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. now uh, in excess of two million people. Wow. So you have to put that into the uh, into the equation as well. Mm -hmm. So um, in in the papers that I've I've read that that you wrote, um, you 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 know often I, I've seen that you've talked to people, you've interviewed them, people that are you know homeless, people that are in these uh, doya guy that we've been talking about and and you've gotten them to really like open up and tell you you know about their situations, why they're there, why they choose to do the things they do um, how, how is it that you go about approaching the, these individuals that are, it, I, I would assume you know in situations that normally you, you probably wouldn't want to open up to some stranger about, right? Well, um, that isn't necessarily so. Um, mm. Actually, uh, people who are living in Doyagai or mm -hmm. have become homeless, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes they, they actually do want to talk. They want mm -hmm. to explain their situation. They want to justify themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, Tony, you've got to remember that these guys have plenty of time. True. So it's actually yeah. a lot mm -hmm. easier to uh, to have a long conversation with um, uh, a, a day laborer who hasn't got a job today um, mm -hmm. or uh, a guy who's living under uh, a bridge by the mm -hmm. on, by a river uh, than it is to interview a busy salaryman they have mm -hmm. the time mm -hmm. and in many cases they also have the inclination and mm -hmm. um, well the other thing is that uh, Back in the 80s, I was a journalist, but after that, I went back to uh, school and got a doctorate in social anthropology. And um, uh, we anthropologists take pride in lengthy fieldwork. Uh, mm -hmm. I spent two years uh, studying Kotobuki Cho, and, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I put in a lot of time uh, to get to know these guys. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's, it was actually very interesting, uh, uh, moving from journalism to anthropology. It's a bit like moving from the hundred meters up to the marathon. You know, you're mm -hmm. still talking to people and writing stuff about them. Uh, it's just mm -hmm. that, uh, it, it, it takes massively more time <laughs> and gets yeah. read by far fewer people. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. so true. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the, the people that, that you've talked to, like in one, and I think I mentioned the same article already, but, um, you, you collected cans with somebody, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. How did, did you just say like, what are you going to do today? And then he said, I'm doing this. Can I go with you? Is that, is that kind of how it works? Um, well, more or less, uh, uh -huh. the particular man you're talking about was living in a, homeless shelter in Kawasaki and I also mm -hmm. lived in that homeless shelter for a couple of weeks uh, that's oh. one of the things that I do uh, and oh. um, uh -huh. uh, yeah I did ask him to take me with him and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and he kindly did um, mm -hmm. and so I learned a lot about uh, can collecting there um, mm -hmm. 
and, and the, the uh, economy of can collecting that was also a little interesting tidbit there how the economy crashed <laughs> uh yes right? um yeah. uh well i i was doing that field work back in mm-hmm. i think 2007 and uh-huh. uh of course we had the uh, global economic crisis in 2008 which mm-hmm. affected commodity prices as well mm-hmm. uh and um uh you know, it meant that you had to collect a whole lot more uh, aluminum cans uh, mm. in order to uh, make enough money for a few drinks, which is what mm-hmm. many of them are tr- are trying to do. Mm-hmm. So how how do you go about then, like, how do homeless shelters work in, in Japan? Are they, do they work a bit different from what you know in other places mm. um like one thing that really really stood out to me in, in that article was like some of them would some of those shelters gave cigarettes to the the yeah. people living there like that was just that, that just blew my mind but could, could you give yeah. a little bit of context for you know shelters and how kind of the ins and outs sure well mm. um there are uh, by the way until mm. about the year 2003 when the homeless uh independent support law was passed Mm -hmm. there were virtually no municipal homeless shelters in japan um Mm -hmm. so uh, it's uh, a system that has mostly grown up since then um and uh there are roughly 40 to 50 of them around japan now and uh, uh there are two kinds one are one kind is called uh, emergency shelters and the other kind are called, um, uh, Juritsu Shien Center or, mm. um, autonomy support centers, uh, self-reliance support centers, something like that. So the, mm. uh, emergency ones are where you go straight off the street and you're not supposed to stay there for longer than, uh, typically a month uh, in some mm. cities, two months. Uh, and mm. the other kind, uh, you, you, you're supposed to kind of graduate from the emergency shelter to the autonomy support center where they will, um, do things like, um, helping you find a job, uh, job mm-hmm. introductions, help you to write, uh, a, a, a resume, um, mm-hmm. put you in a, in a nice suit, uh, and sometimes put you on training courses, uh, mm. forklift truck, um, heavy duty vehicles, um, mm. a security guard. Uh, these are uh, typical jobs that homeless people get uh, trained up for at these places. And mm. um, uh, actually, since I wrote that paper, the, uh, the cigarette uh, allowance has been steadily uh, cut uh, at mm. uh, my local homeless shelter in Yokohama. Last time I checked, mm. they were down to six a day. Um, it's still <laughs> shocking for some people. So it's people. a gradual process. Huh? Uh, yeah, it's, well, it's mostly to do with um, budget cuts, actually. Uh, but, huh. um, but, you know, Japan does have this kind of tolerant side to it. Um, mm-hmm. most of these shelters, in fact, uh, uh, all of them, uh, do not allow, uh, drinking alcohol, uh, alcoholic beverages. Uh, mm-hmm. and the attitude is, um, these guys, they all love to drink. We're not going to let them do that. Ah, well, at least let them have some cigarettes. <laughs> and, uh, that, that is a, a fairly prevalent view in Japan. Huh. Yeah. Like I, I remember you mentioning something very similar, um, when you were talking, uh, about somebody else, Nishikawa san, somebody else that you extensively, extensively researched, but, um, mm-hmm. in, when he was, uh, in like a nursing home hospice kind of situation, like they didn't let him have alcohol, but they let him have cigarettes, right? Uh, yes. Well, um, Nishikawa san is the, was the day laborer who I, studied most he became my kind of star informant if you like and he mm-hmm. is the uh, subject of my 2015 book yokohama street life mm-hmm. uh, and um uh, uh in his last days 
Uh, he died in the same year that book was published, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, when he was in hospital, he wasn't even allowed to smoke. But mm -hmm. uh, before that, there were uh, three or four years when he was suffering from uh, gradually worsening uh, dementia. Uh, mm -hmm. But he was still living in a doya. And mm -hmm. the and he was living on welfare, and the uh, caseworker in charge of him looked after his money, uh, because mm -hmm. if he had money himself, he would immediately spend it on alcohol, uh, yeah. which would kill him, as it eventually mm -hmm. did. He died of uh, liver uh, liver cancer in the end, mm -hmm. um, and the uh, so the caseworker would take him shopping a couple of times a week. And he was allowed to buy cigarettes, um, mm. although um, he, he had a, a he had an agreement with his doctor uh, not to that he wouldn't be allowed to buy alcohol. It was a voluntary agreement. I don't think mm. it's legally possible to um, force people right. on welfare to uh, not spend their money on uh, alcohol if that's what they want to do. Mm. Right, right. So. Um, you mentioned it towards the beginning of, of, of our conversation, but, um, you know, there, there's been obviously a big change from, you know, 50, 60, you know, in the past 30, 40 years. But, um, you know, how how has the area changed? And what about in more recent times? Like I see on the news, of course, you know, there's a, with the coronavirus and the pandemic, there's a lot of people that have also lost their jobs. And I've, I've seen reports yeah. on people, you know, going, lining up to get meals because they they've lost their sources of income. I wonder if you've noticed anything even in, in more recent times. Well, um, when I started studying Kotobukicho, there were mm -hmm. just under 100 doya, about 97, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Now there are about 120 or so. Uh, mm -hmm. So although the day laboring lifestyle has gradually uh, faded away, uh, mm -hmm. the doya have actually increased rather than decreasing. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is because welfare recipients are actually much better tenants for the uh, owners of these properties than day laborers. With a day laborer, you never know uh, when he, whether he's going to make enough money to pay his rent. He might accidentally mm -hmm. spend it all gambling or drinking on his way home. Whereas mm -hmm. with welfare cases, uh, you can be sure that the rent will be paid uh, regularly by the city authorities, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it. It's therefore uh, actually quite a good business uh, because mm -hmm. you have to remember that although uh, the uh, rent per room per night is low, uh, because of the very small size of the rooms, the rental True. income per square meter is actually comparable to a pretty posh hotel. Right. So we've seen an increase in these um, relatively new smart doya. Uh, they even mm -hmm. have, uh, elevators. Um, 20 mm -hmm. years ago, that would have been totally unthinkable, a doya with an mm -hmm. elevator. But, um, mm -hmm. it, nowadays, if you don't have an elevator, uh, you, you probably won't be allowed to take on welfare recipients. And so, mm -hmm. uh, the doya guy has kind of evolved, uh, to meet the change from, uh, being a, a workers' town to being a welfare town. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and and I I wonder if if it, that increase in the number of welfare recipients also has something to do with the aging population. Is there any kind of link there that you know of? Uh, certainly, um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's closely related to that mm. um, uh, because. Uh, the average age of men in Doigai these days is somewhere mm. in the early 60s. And mm. their average age of death is somewhere in their late 60s. In other words, mm. they, their lives are roughly 20 years shorter than the average Japanese male. Uh, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, the aging population um, has... Uh, uh, affected doya guys really uh, very obviously 
Mm-hmm. Um, two two last areas that I want to ask you about. But one, um, we, we've talked a lot about men, um, and and so maybe some listeners mm-hmm. are wondering, you know, so are there many homeless women in Japan? Um, what, what can you tell us about that? Um, there are very few homeless women in Japan. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, uh, over the years, there have been many surveys of the homeless population. In fact, the government does one every year, uh, mm-hmm. usually in January. Um, and uh, typically, they find 97 to 99% of homeless people are male. Um, mm-hmm. uh, that's not... An entirely reliable figure because sure. there are good reasons why homeless women don't want to be in the, the sort of places where homeless people gather uh, because mm-hmm, they want mm-hmm. to avoid being raped or sexually harassed uh, sure. and, and so on. So it, uh, I do believe there are um, uh, uh, some homeless women who are missed by these surveys. Um, mm-hmm. But... Um, uh, even so, I think there's no question that the um, population of homeless people is overwhelmingly male. And mm-hmm. that is for a number of reasons. Uh, one is that um, uh, to the average uh, Japanese uh, welfare official, uh, a mm-hmm. homeless woman is much more shocking than a homeless man. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're male you're not that old and you're relatively healthy, um, they, they may turn you down for welfare and tell you to go and get a job. Sure. Uh, whereas if you're a woman, and even more if you're a woman with children, uh, they will immediately believe that you cannot uh, support yourself. Uh, because mm. of the endemic sexism in Japanese society, women mm. are not supposed to be independent in the first place. Uh, mm. And uh, so there's a lot more sympathy for uh, women in trouble than men in trouble. So in this particular case, uh, Japanese-style sexism happens to work in women's favor. Mm. Also, mm. separate from all these homeless shelters that we've been talking about, there are a lot of institutions specifically for women, um, mm-hmm. homes for battered wives, for example, victims mm-hmm. of domestic sure. violence, uh, and um, uh, uh, low-cost public housing for single mothers. Uh, mm-hmm. And so uh, a lot of women who might otherwise end up being homeless are taken care of in these systems which are, are not considered part of the uh, homeless support system in, in, in Japan. Mm-hmm. No. Okay, now thank you for clearing that up. Um, one, one last area that I want to ask you, and it's, uh, I guess, uh, perhaps a little bit more uh, geared towards you and, and your personal insights in that, you know, you've, you've been doing research on this in, in some form for over 30 years now. Mm. And... You know, the way that I, I see you write about these individuals and, and the way that I've seen you, you know, tell the story of, of Nishikawa-san, like, I, it, it tells me that, like, yes, there's an, imp- you do consider this important academic work, but there's also something more for you that you, you seem to find, you know, fulfilling in, in this work. And, and I'm wondering, you know, kind of what, what has this work taught you? What do you think the importance of, of documenting, you know, and, and telling the stories of the individuals that you talk to is? Hmm. Okay, well, uh, hey, I like hanging out in slums. Some people, <laughs> some people Well, it seems like, like some of those guys could, uh-huh. could be fun. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are a lot of interesting characters, uh, uh-huh. and um, they're they're pretty easy to talk to. Um, sure. Uh, although I should add that that people who are really depressed and really think mm-hmm. that their lives have been a complete failure are much mm-hmm. less likely to talk to a foreigner right. like me. Um, mm-hmm. And that means that um, I'd have to admit that one of the weaknesses of my research is that it probably tends to color the Doya guy in slightly brighter colors than mm. uh, would be uh, strictly accurate. Um, sure. uh, but uh, anyway, um, 
one of the reasons why I find these places so fascinating uh, is because the choices available in Japanese society seem to be so polarized. Um, mm-hmm. That was what immediately struck me about these places. Japan mm-hmm. is famous for lifetime employment, right? Mm-hmm. These guys mm-hmm. are employed for one day at a time. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the traditional day laboring st- lifestyle involves working one day, then resting uh, the next day. Uh, mm-hmm. And so if you haven't got a home loan, you haven't got a wife, you haven't got kids, then you can actually survive by working every other day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, on the other hand, of course, you have no security of employment, obviously. You mm-hmm. Also, um, uh, very little in the way of um, insurance, health insurance, mm-hmm. um, unemployment insurance. Uh, you, you don't have all these um, systems that uh, regularly employed people have uh, in Japan. And mm-hmm. um, so uh, uh, that's what really sparked my interest. Uh, mm-hmm. wh- where I come from, Britain, uh, mm-hmm. It's pretty rare to work for one day, um, mm-hmm. e- even if you're a, a casual uh, laborer on a building site. Mm-hmm. Typically, you'll work there until they finish the project, or at least you'll be employed by the week. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and on the other hand, um, you know, regularly employed people are much more likely to change jobs uh, than. Uh, than uh, they are in Japan. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, uh, it, it seems that you can have lots of security but no freedom. That's the mm-hmm. salaryman lifestyle. Or you can have lots of freedom but no security. That's the mm. day laborer lifestyle. Mm. And um, uh, there's, uh, th- there's not that much in between. Or at least that was the case when I started. Nowadays, sure. of course, we also have Fritas, neats, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. and various other categories of uh, insecurely or, or or not employed people as well. The, right, the pictures right, right. become a, a little more complex. Hmm. Um, sorry, just thought of one one last question, and it's something that that perhaps some of the listeners m- might have wondered. But um, I mean, if you were to tell a Japanese person, like I, oh, you know, I, I go to Kotobuki on a regular basis, I go to you know uh, Sanya or whatever, they might say like, oh, it, isn't that dangerous? Like, are are you okay? Like, you shouldn't be going there. H- have you ever felt like in danger? Have you ever built it in in a situation that you thought, oh, this is unsafe? Um, not really. I mean, you're absolutely right that uh, when when I talk to Japanese people uh, mm-hmm. it, and if I tell them that I do this kind of research, well, mm-hmm. either they don't even know what a doya guy is. <laughs> right. Well, that 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 accounts for you know more than half the population probably. Mm-hmm. And if they do know what it is, then they'll say, "Oh, how can you do something so dangerous? Or why would you want to go?" to such a a dreadful place. Mm -hmm. Uh, In fact, you know, considering that, uh, for example, Kotobukicho uh, is the uh, worst neighborhood in Mm -hmm. uh, a city of over 3 million inhabitants, Yokohama, it's Mm -hmm. actually relatively clean and pretty safe. Well, especially Mm -hmm. now that everybody's got so old. But Mm -hmm. during the two years when I was going there regularly um i never saw a gun i've never seen a gun anywhere in japan doya guy mm. or elsewhere uh, except mm. o- on the hip of a policeman mm. and um uh, i only two or three times i guess i saw a knife drawn in anger mm. uh, and uh, well a couple of times people tried to punch me in the face uh, <laughs> i i uh, Used a well-known technique known as running away. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the only time I suffered injury w- uh, was on uh, New Year's Day 1994 when an extremely drunk day laborer jumped on me and bit me in the head. 
<laughs> but oh he God. but he didn't draw blood and uh, -huh. uh he was just trying to be friendly really but he uh -huh. was just so drunk he didn't really know what he just, was just just wrestling around uh, horse playing uh, uh, yeah uh horse play uh, that went uh, <laughs> a, a, a little further than i'd have liked <laughs> uh but wow. i didn't hold it against him it's uh, sure. uh you know when i was doing that field work uh, yeah. I had uh, I had friends at the London School of Economics who were doing field work uh, among um, warring tribes in Ethiopia or Maoist <laughs> guerrillas in Peru. Sure. Uh, compared, that, yeah, with, that's not as <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's pretty compared, dangerous. Yeah, compared with that, um, Doya guy, a, a picnic on the vicarage lawn, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. All right. Well, th thank you so much. It's such a, you know, you, you have a very unique insight into this aspect of, of Japanese society that not a lot of people have. So th thank you so much for sharing it. And, and I, I enjoyed reading your, your work. And, and uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, you're very welcome. If you want to check out some of Dr. Gill's research, uh, I highly recommend checking out his academia.edu page. There's a lot of articles there uh, which you can download and read. Uh, so link in the show notes for that. Also, check out his book, Yokohama Street Life, The Precarious Career of a Japanese Day Laborer. Uh, you can find it on Amazon, and that's why I have an Amazon affiliate link. So link in the show notes or japankyo.com slash Amazon. Anything you purchase using those links uh, will go towards supporting this show, and it will prevent a few pennies from going to Amazon. So, hey, we all win, right? <laughs> So anyway, if you're interested in all that stuff, check that out. Thank you so much to Dr. Gill. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, send them over to mail at japanstationpodcast.com. Don't forget to follow on Facebook and Twitter at Japankyo News. There's actually been quite a few new followers over on Facebook. Thank you so much to everybody who's followed on Facebook. I really appreciate it. Uh, if you haven't already, then why not go ahead and do that? Facebook, Twitter at Japankyo News. Uh, thank you to you know me for providing the opening and closing song, Oedo Controller. Link in the show notes that does it for this episode next one should be coming out on august 15th um there's a small chance i may have to skip that one or delay it i i'm not sure i've got some travel stuff going on if that comes together i may have to go to florida again this thing has been up in the air for a long time uh but keep an eye out for that or just hit the subscribe button and uh, you won't miss the next episode when it comes out uh don't forget to check out the latest episode of ichimon japan episode 48 that one is all about famous dogs from japan so uh we're talking about hachiko we're talking about a bunch of other ones including one that can do buddhist chants so <laughs> it's a fun episode go check that out ichimon japan uh, you can find it at japanko.com slash ichimonjapan or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, go find your miniature pony. Just do it!